It seemed nothing short of miraculous. mRNA vaccines approved for human use for the first time brought the end of the COVID-19 pandemic into sight less than a year after it had been declared. Shattering records for development, the Moderna and Pfizer BioNTech vaccines were conceived, created, tested, and approved for emergency use in months, not years. But that feat was made possible by decades of foundational work by hundreds of scientists whose combined efforts created platforms upon which the mRNA vaccines were swiftly built. The coronavirus vaccines and how quickly they became available was just really an incredible example how when scientists, policymakers, um, manufacturers, industry people come together and the government supports, puts in the resources to be able to do this, how quickly you can go from zero to vaccinated. But what people I don't think appreciate is that that mRNA um, technology has been in the laboratories and clinical trials for a decade, even longer, and work on coronavirus to understand what would be the protein that you would target. That's been happening since SARS first emerged in 2003. Well, I think it's a really interesting story when you go back on the mRNA development over decades because a couple of the pioneers, Catalin Carrico and Drew Weissman, they had really struggled. They couldn't get grants. Uh, they had a lot of uh, naysayers about their efforts. Uh, but really it was that basic science investment, which wasn't really mission driven, that, that was the foundation for this rapid success. All these things that people have been working on for 30 years have now exploded into the success around this vaccine and the ability to do it quickly. And all of these things wouldn't have been happening if it weren't for all the work that everybody has been doing for the past 20 to 30 years. I mean, think about it. It's the first truly new vaccination technology in decades. If you had told me, as you said a year ago, that we're gonna use mRNA as a vaccine platform, I would have said that's not gonna work because the mRNA is just gonna get degraded. Um, but what, the companies came up with a trick of encapsulating it in these nanoparticles, and those nanoparticles are designed in a way that cells take them up. So that's the trick. Pandemic urgency gave mRNA vaccines the chance to prove themselves. Having passed this critical test, this adaptable platform could be exploited to protect against other disease threats. Today, we need methodologies that we can rapidly adapt so that when a new pathogen arises, we can make a vaccine against it. And those types of methodologies are what we refer to as platform technologies. Well, it's a person and opportunity at the same time to move forward technologies that probably we were seeing with a little bit of hesitation, which is the messenger and a vaccine technology. Uh, something that has been, uh, research has been done and proven that there was a profile of safe, safety, but the pandemic certainly accelerated our interest into responding quickly to it and developing this technology for uh, the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. Um, we can apply the same technology for viruses that are in chickens or for viruses that are in humans. Okay? I think it's, it's opening a lot of exciting possibilities for other vaccines. Um, to be able to use the mRNA technology, all you need to know is a sequence and you can then create this mRNA-based vaccine to almost anything and do it rapidly. I am fairly certain that you're gonna see more widespread use of mRNA-based vaccines because they've been shown to be so effective. I suspect that um, you may also see some further engineering of these vaccines so that they remain immunogenic. I do think now that we have new vaccine platform technologies, we will change the way we think about emerging infectious diseases. And I don't think that we're going to be left at, in, in, such a, in such a position with future emerging infectious disease emergencies. What we've now shown with this pandemic is that we can be very fast at developing vaccines for, uh, for novel pathogens, at least this novel pathogen, which may have been a relatively easy 
virus against which to develop a vaccine, but nevertheless, we did it in about 300 days between the sequence availability and data supporting use of the, the product. Uh, so the question is, um, what tools do we now have at our disposal that can allow us to shorten the timeline even further? And here, the mRNA platforms provide a tremendous opportunity for us to identify viruses of interest ahead of time, develop candidate vaccines against those viruses, ideally um, broadly effective vaccines so that multiple viruses within a given family would be addressed by that vaccine and do that across multiple families so that you have a toolkit of vaccines that are uh, ready to be tested in an efficacy trial once a pandemic emerges. Uh, if you were so lucky as to have a candidate vaccine against the virus that emerges. Influenza is a mutable virus that takes hundreds of thousands of lives each year and has caused several devastating pandemics over the last century, making it a prime target for the mRNA vaccine platform. There's only a limited number of vaccine technologies that we've been using uh, to create influenza vaccines. We have eggs, we have cell culture based, and we have recombinant um, proteins. Now, you know, with some of these new vaccine platforms, the mRNA platforms uh, and vector uh, platforms, that may give us more flexibility uh, to create better influenza vaccines and also uh, maybe the opportunity to be able to change the vaccine mid-season if we see, you know, something a shift in what's circulating uh, in people um, because those vaccines can be manufactured very quickly and relatively inexpensively and um, it, it's a lot easier than, than working with the whole virus. The system is already primed and we've learned so much from the COVID-19 vaccines that I think we could rapidly synthesize and test uh, uh, an mRNA based influenza vaccine and if it's as immunogenic as it is with COVID-19, then again, your likelihood of it being a successful way to immunize against flu is very high. Messenger RNA technology could allow us to make vaccines that are less um, affected by these things of growing the virus in tissue culture in eggs. Is that right? So you basically sequence the virus, recognize the antigen that you need, you clone it, and you're not, you don't need to express it anywhere but in the arm of the host that received the vaccine. There will be a time where we can probably use mRNA vaccine technologies against influenza, and you could technically print out new hemagglutinin uh, versions every year. We want a vaccine that we don't have to update. We want to find a part of the flu vaccine that doesn't change, so you don't have to update it. We want to be able to be kind of one and done the way we are with measles or mumps or rubella, other viruses for which we have vaccines. When, when I dream about these vaccines late at night, I'd want a vaccine that um, ideally you'd only give us one shot, but I don't think that's realistic. I think it's probably more realistic that we would give one shot every three to five years, and I'd be quite happy with that. The mRNA does appear to have the ultimate flexibility. You go from sequence to template uh, in, in a matter of hours, really. So, you know, I think this is the front runner. Uh, it's got proof now. It's got incredible momentum uh, and experience, so it's really ideal for the uh, um, universal vaccines of the future. I actually think that the advent of vaccine development after COVID will allow these new technologies or newer technologies, because some of them have been around for quite a number of years, um, help push the development of making a universal influenza vaccine further than we've been able to achieve uh, in the last 10, maybe 15 years. Researchers had long recognized the strategic potential of mRNA-based influenza vaccines, but lacked the necessary resources to carry the product across the R&D finish line. Now, with greater financial support and the vast evidence base created during COVID-19, those plans are moving forward. So in the case of uh, mRNA vaccines, we have a platform that until COVID had shown a lot of promise. There had been programs taken all the way up through phase two development, but there had never been a phase three efficacy trial con uh, conducted with these vaccines because there either wasn't uh, enough uh, capital available to make that investment, risk tolerance to do that, 
or disease available, uh, circulating disease available to actually conduct an efficacy trial or some combination thereof. I think it is, uh, you know, it's a platform that we absolutely should pursue for, for flu. Look, I think that mRNA has become the, the new default technology to apply to every pathogen. And, and I think you hammer everything with mRNA approaches to see if you can make it work. And only when you show that you can't, despite a lot of you know, optimization of all these parameters, then do you, then do you look for other approaches. But I think it's, it's table stakes is mRNA for everything, including flu. Simpler and far quicker to make than their traditional counterparts, mRNA vaccines could potentially be produced in many countries where vaccines are not currently manufactured. I think that we're at a unique uh, moment in time with the demonstration of the, of, of the mRNAs um, to give countries a way to leapfrog existing vaccine manufacturing, as well as a gateway to, uh, to more traditional manufacturing. I think we need to make sure that we make the manufacturing process as easy as we can um, so that it can be transferred to low to middle income countries. And I think that is probably something that we should do with all vaccine technologies, um, that all low to middle income countries, and in fact all countries, should have the ability to make vaccines for themselves and to supply worldwide. mRNA vaccines could be key to quashing future viral outbreaks before they have the chance to become pandemics. Decentralized vaccine manufacturing would make this happen even faster, a goal that agile mRNA vaccine technology brings within reach. I think coming out of this pandemic, it's a huge lesson learned for many countries and regions. They're gonna have a, a lot of demand for, for this kind of capacity building. On the um, on a on a positive, very positive note, we do have some new technologies that can help here, and I I think the mRNAs uh, vaccines are the best example. These are chemistry-based approaches. I believe that they can be more amenable to introduction to countries as platforms that they can um, build an ecosystem to support. And if they can get off the ground with mRNA. Um, or chemistry-based approaches to vaccine manufacturing, I think that can then serve as a gateway to, um, to the more complex traditional vaccine manufacturing. mRNA exemplifies the emerging technology that can not only lead us out of this pandemic, but could stop the next one if we invest now in applying, refining, and distributing it worldwide. I think of R&D as a, as a machine where you put in about a dollar, so you put in a dollar and it spits back at least $5. It's what the greatest investment machine in the universe. You put in a dollar, it's going to give you at least $5 back on average. It's incredible. The reason innovation produces such a high return is because of its spillovers. It's because the benefits it creates bring benefit to so many different people in so many different pockets, if you will. Okay, so for example, let's take something very concrete in our minds, a COVID vaccine. But the value of the lives saved is the value of that is in excess of what people are paying for that vaccine. The value of starting up the economy again is so greatly in excess of the cost of that vaccine. Because we're talking trillions of dollars. I think we have in our hands today the power to protect all future generations from pandemics. I mean, that's that's incredible. I mean, this this is uh, the biggest accomplishment of the century, and um, and it happened, you know, right below our, our noses. I mean, we we were sitting around dealing with this pandemic, and boom. We right in front. What unfolded in front of us was this roadmap to to prevent the next pandemic, and nobody can ever take that away from us.